Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here to give this talk on space division multiplexing and few mode fibers. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank my um, colleagues at Bell Labs and our um, collaborators who've provided us with uh, spatial multiplexers, uh, fibers, oscilloscopes, and uh, wavelength switch ideas. So as you've heard in this conference, we're running out of capacity in fiber. We've used up the, all the dimensions, basically, the wavelength dimension, the time dimension, the uh, I and Q dimension, the complex constellation space, and polarization space. So the only one left is the space. So in a, a space division link, we, we aim to increase the capacity by the number of modes. So we, we start, uh, the link consists of many components. First, we need to get the end data signals onto the link using a spatial multiplexer. They must transmit down some fiber that supports multiple modes or multiple spatial paths, have to amplify all these modes, and then we have to be able to route these modes too. Um, because these links can be long, you expect to have, a, and there are many components in them, scrambling is in inevitable. Um, like you, you don't expect to be able to make a single mode fiber uh, link without having polarization mixing. So you always have a the DSP now these days always has a polarization demultiplexer in it. So saying that, at the receiver, um, what we should do after the spatial demux is measure each mode coherently and then go through some multiple input, multiple output digital signal processing, which can undo the scrambling of the link. For such a system to work, we must have the, all the components must have low mode-dependent loss. Uh, mode-dependent loss effectively is like uh, losing modes. So if you have high mode-dependent loss, you've reduce your number of modes and reduce your capacity. And also to make the equalizers easier to uh, build in the MIMO DSP you should minimize the group delay because the group delay um, requires more memory in an equalizer. So there are many ways, many different uh, fibers that you can do space division multiplexing on, including multi-core, few mode, ring core, a more exotic types such as hollow core fiber and even uh, multi-core fiber with uh, some air gaps in it. Uh, to get onto these fibers, we need the spatial multiplexers. Um, in this talk, I'll, I'll show some a, a photonic lantern spatial multiplexer, and we also need some routing elements. Um, I will show a wavelength switch. So why are we interested in few mode fibers? First of all, they're very easy to work with in the lab, and they also look almost like a single mode fiber. Just by increasing the core diameter, you can easily scale the number of modes. So like a conventional multimode fiber might have 50 plus modes. So if you could use all of them, you'd already have a 50 times increase in capacity. Um, they are, you can use a normal splicer with them. And there's the largest number of modes per cross-sectional area of any of these, those other fiber types I showed. So you can also think about building efficient components uh, that uh, reuse um, the uh, efficient components that use less uh, less amount of devices and equivalent links. Uh, uh, sorry, I'll get to that later. Um, so for instance, an amplifier, um, you can use one pump to pump all, to amplify all the modes. And uh, secondly, most free space components, such as a wavelength switch or a coupler, uh, can be easily adapted to few mode fibers without much work. So why would you go to all this trouble for space division multiplexing uh, when you could just have n parallel links? So you can, you can increase the capacity with n spatial paths. However, if you do this, the cost will scale linearly with the number of paths. Uh, this is because every path you add, you have to add the same number of amplifiers, the same number of routing elements, and the same number of isolators. So if you put all the, the paths in one fiber, um, you can start sharing components. For instance, this is an illustration showing the three paths all in one fiber. So you can have three times less amplifiers, three times less routing and rounding elements for the same capacity. However, this integration will come at an expense of uh, mode mixing because you're putting all your signals closer together. So this is why we need to think about using the, uh, considering that we have to do spatial multiplexing with some type of multiple input, multiple output processing. So these are the, the first six modes that you can place information on in a few mode fiber. I showed the, the vector modes just to show that the fiber modes are actually very complicated. They have very complex polarization. Uh, since fiber is a, a weakly guiding waveguide, we can approximate these as, uh, we normally approximate them as a scalar, uh, using the scalar approximation as a linear polarized mode. 
So these you can separate into both the spatial component and the polarization component. And uh, they're much easier to look at. Um, and they're, they're almost even more insightful to use in calculations. So the boxes around the modes indicate the modes that, the near degenerate modes. And within these groups, you expect very strong coupling. Um, within the boxes, you expect strong coupling. Between the boxes, you expect weak coupling, but there should still be some type of coupling, mode coupling. So this example just shows, uh, I'm showing a perfect fiber, what the impulse response might look like versus time down fiber. Uh, each mode will travel at a different speed because they, and this is the effect that this causes a differential group delay. If we also consider that you can't make a perfect fiber, like a, a perfect fiber would have no coupling, if you have DGD and coupling, um, you start to get very complex impulse responses, like the, the light goes from one mode to another mode and back and forth a lot. So um, I'm showing these impulse responses to give you an idea of uh, what the MIMO DSP must do. It must undo these, um, this type of scrambling. And compared to normal single-mode fiber systems, the, the DGD can be much larger, so this is a little more challenging. So this is another uh, view of mode mixing. So in perfect fiber, if you launch a mode, it maintains its shape through the whole fiber. However, um, in, you can say that in these uh, multiple fibers, over long distances, you don't really, the modes do not really exist because you cannot launch any um, spatial pattern that will maintain its shape through the fiber. So the MIMO, just, I just want to show this to show what the MIMO does. It tries to undo these uh, spatial patterns by measuring uh, coherent samples all across a beam, and then you can, you can reconstruct your input fields. So now I want to show uh, some types of mode multiplexers to launch light onto the few mode fibers. This is a brute force technique using, uh, by you, 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 it's a phase mask multiplexer. You launch Gaussian beams out of collimators and then you, you convert them into the fiber modes using phase masks. So you can see in the bottom left um, that if the, the phases of the different modes can be well approximated by zero pi uh, masks. Then you passively combine these using splitters and image them onto the funeral fiber. Uh, you can demultiplex the modes the same way. So this type of multiplexer is nice because you, uh, you, can, you can right away start to look at the modal crosstalk characteristics of fiber. So this is a actual measured mode transfer matrix of a fiber in the time domain. Um, the top cells is the LP01 to LP01 mode transmission. The bottom four cells are the the transmission between the LP11 modes. So you can see that in those cells, there's a strong peak that corresponds to, that arrives at a different time for 0, 1, 1, 1. This corresponds to the DGD difference between the two modes, two mode groups. Uh, within the mode groups, there's strong coupling. So you see, like for the 1, 1 mode, you see energy in all four cells. Um, there's also crosstalk. The crosstalk appears in the, between the 0, 1 group and the 1, 1 group, and the crosstalk appears in the red cells and appears as a plateau. The energy in the plat the reason why it's spread out in time is because there's DGD between the modes, and the crosstalk from the mode multiplexers is uh, indicated by the, 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 the first and the, the peaks at the beginning and the end of the plateau. So another way I like to look at the transfer matrix is to look at the spectrogram. So this, this you compute by uh, spectrally resolving uh, each temporal component or temporally resolving each spectral component of the transfer function. This helps identify modes. So, like for instance, if you look at the top left cell for the zero one mode, you can see a clear uh, streak. That's the zero one mode. But you also see something at the lower wavelengths, with, which is a higher order mode, where the higher order modes start becoming guided. And likewise, you see the in the one one cells, you see the one one peaks, and in the crosstalk cells, you can see the crosstalk plateau. So, since couplings probably always going to happen. Um, maybe, uh, is crosstalk actually bad? So a lot of people are saying that crosstalk is actually good because it can minimize the mode dependencies. So this is just an example. If you have low coupling, you end up with these large plateaus in the transfer function. If you have median coupling, the uh, plateaus start to disappear and it, the transfer functions become more rounded. If you have very strong coupling, the light basically never stays in one mode and cannot accumulate a lot of differential, a lot of delay. It's always going back and forth a lot. So 
the, the growth of the DGD um, grows more by a square root dependence with distance than a linear dependence. And the same thing can be said for other modal dependencies also, like the uh, modal dependent gains and modal dependent losses. So I, I guess the conclusion for this slide is uh, weak coupling is difficult to deal with, but strong coupling actually might be beneficial. So if you're going to have a strong coupling and design fibers with strong coupling anyway, it doesn't make much sense to try to excite each mode individually. You can excite orthogonal combinations of modes. And since you have the MIMO demultiprocessing at the receiver, you can undo all the scrambling and recover your information. So this type of multiplexer is called a uh, photonic lantern spatial multiplexer. Um, it's called photonic lantern because it was called that. They have a similar device in astronomy, and that's what they were calling it. On one side, you have single mode fibers. The other side, you have a, a multi-core waveguide whose modes um, approximate the few mode fiber modes. Uh, in order to, for this to work, all you have to do is have an adiabatic transition between this multi-core waveguide and the single mode fibers at the input. So as you can see, if you launch light into the outer core or the central core, uh, you do not get, you get a linear combination of modes uh, rather than the actual few mode fiber spatial modes. So this, this multiplexer is nice because it's actually uh, it's lossless. It can be lossless and uh, have no mode dependent loss. And it can be scalable to, you could probably scale to excite all 50 modes in the few mode fiber. So you can um, make this using 3D laser waveguide inscription. Uh, professor, you can go to Professor Yu's lab and use his laser setup. Uh, this is just an example of how you how you'd make it. 3D waveguides are nice uh, because you can package them kind of like you package a, a planar light wave circuit. So in the bottom just shows a packaged multiplexer. Actually, there's four multiplexers on there. So one side there's a 12 fiber single mode fiber array, and the other side there's a four a mode there's a four fiber few mode fiber array. And this is for a three mode fiber. This multiplexer. So if another way to explain how this multiplexer works is you can analyze it as a demultiplexer. So if you look at the, the cross section of the waveguide, the multiplexer at the output, you can see it supports the six few mode fiber modes. Then as you move the cores further and further apart, um, the, the modes of the structure still look like the fiber modes, but they gradually become isolated more to, isolated only to spots. So since you have this, you, you do not lose any modes in this transition from the uh, coupled core array to the uncoupled core array, and you can make any of the core modes, you can make any of the core modes by superposition of all the, the output modes, then this means that you can use this as both a demux and a multiplexer. So another, another type of multiplexer, uh, is, is the, similar, the same type of multiplexer can also be made in an all, all fiber version. Um, you start by uh, taking single mode fibers, putting them in a, a, a cylindrical capillary with a lower index that has a lower refractive index in the cladding of the single mode fiber, then taper the structure down. And then when, once the structure is tapered completely down, you have a, the output of the structure, the single mode fiber cores are too small to guide light and by themselves. However, the light is now all guided in the cladding. Um, and the, 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 you have a new cladding which is formed by the capillary, which is green. So what's nice about this type of multiplexer is it, it's an all fiber device. So it can be um, spliced directly to a few mode fiber and spliced directly to single mode fiber. Uh, this is one of our devices that we've made. Uh, this is just a movie to show how you might make it. You shove your fibers into capillary, you pull it, you taper it, and then at the end you have a new uh, multi-mode core. So I, I want to just show what you need to do to start to characterize some of these space division multiplexing devices. So every device in a system um, can be represented by a transfer matrix uh, with n times n different elements. Uh, each element represents a different path in the system. So like a spatial multiplexer would um, relate the input fiber modes or the, the output fiber modes to the single mode fiber inputs. So yeah, and the and a few mode fiber or a any type of fiber would relate a would have a transfer matrix that relates the the input modes to its output modes. And you can use any basis you want, like you could use OAM modes or whatever. So in order to measure these matrices, you'd have to launch 
end signals and receive end signals coherently. So this is very difficult, it requires a lot of equipment. Um, however, what, we, what we've been doing in the lab is we've uh, used a time multiplexing scheme and a swept wavelength interferometer to um, measure these transfer matrices with just one, one receiver and one transmitter. So this setup uh, uh, is, is called swept wavelength interferometry. You use a swept laser like you'd use for, Creston showed yesterday, he had this laser for OCT. It scans a wavelength very fast. And then, in, then you have an interferometer. In one arm, you put your, your device you want to test, and the other arm is a reference. And then you have coherent detection for the receiver. And this coherent detection will measure the amplitude and phase at each wavelength. So then you, you add this time lux in front of your, your device you want to measure so that each impulse response will come at a different time. Then you can temporarily separate these impulse responses. Um, so what I want to show you, what I want to characterize is one of these spatial multiplexers. So we have to launch, and I want to just characterize one multiplexer at a time. So I can do the measurement in a reflective mode. So we launch light in to the, each input of the 3D waveguide lantern. It gets coupled to a 20 meter femur fiber. The, the reflection comes back from the cleave facet, goes back through 20 meters of fiber, goes back to the 3D waveguide, and comes to the output. So this is a system matrix we're characterizing. So if you look on one detector, you can clearly see uh, both detectors, there's 44 matrix elements. These are all measured simultaneously. So they, in, in one sweep, and the sweep takes about 100 milliseconds. So in, in one short measurement, we can measure all 144 impulse responses. So if we put them all on a grid, um, it, this is of the lantern multiplexer, so every impulse response looks the same. You can identify the uh, six mode peaks for the 0, 01 mode, the 11 mode, the two, 0, 02 mode, and the 21 mode. However, looking at the transfer matrix is, uh, is very complicated, and you can't really tell much what's going on for your device. So what you really want to know is what is the mode dependent loss and what's the insertion loss. So you do some a matrix eigen analysis because we have the amplitude and phase. And once you do this matrix eigen analysis, you can extract clearly the mode dependent loss performance and the insertion loss performance of the device. So you can see for these, this multiplexer, we had about a 2 dB mode dependent loss for, for all uh, six modes and a relatively low insertion loss. So once we have our multiplexers and uh, we know they work right with low mode dependent loss, we can start doing some transmission experiments. So I just want to show what a transmission experiment looks like. We uh, generate our, we have a transmitter, then we have a recirculating loop. Uh, and in the loop, we, we have our photonic lantern and 3D waveguide multiplexers. Then to re, we have to receive all the modes at the same time, so uh, we have a 24-channel receiver, coherent receiver, or actually 12-channel 12, 12 coherent receiver, but you need uh, 24 high-speed digitizers. So what we've been able to do with this type of uh, loop is we've been able to transmit uh, 20 gigabaud 16 qualm over 177 kilometers. Uh, spectral efficiency we're able to achieve is uh, above the... Shannon limit for a single mode fiber. So this, could, you could say, have the highest spectral efficiency per core. And we've also been able to drop the modulation format down to QBSK and then transmit longer distance. So we transmitted 700 kilometers. So now uh, I want to just show you a, a quick overview of wavelength selected switch. Wavelength selected switch takes each wavelength on an input fiber, and you can choose, where to, choose which output fiber to route it to. So if you look at a wavelength selective switch, um, this is a few mode fiber or single mode fiber one, you have a collimator array, and then you focus, it makes some beams, you use some anamorphic optics to illuminate enough lines on the grating to get the right resolution, and then you focus everything to a spot on a tuning element. This can be a liquid crystal on silicon or a MEMS pixel. So since it, the only thing you need to do to adapt a, a few mode fiber, a single mode fiber wavelength switch to a few mode fiber wavelength switch is replace a collimator array from a single mode fiber collimator array to a few mode fiber collimator array. And so that's what we did. Um, this is the performance. So in addition, so one, one thing that happens in the few mode fiber switch is you get modal dependencies at the boundaries and this increases, adds some mode dependent loss. So we, we plot both the insertion loss on the bottom and the mode dependent loss on the top. And finally, um, you could also consider 
um, adding spatial diversity to your, your devices. So you could build the same wavelength switch, but rather than routing all the modes simultaneously, you could put a, wave, uh, a mode mux, demux, at the front end of the switch. So this example just shows a, a few mode fiber array, these lantern demultiplexers, going to a linear array. And on this linear array, you only have single mode fibers, uh, single, mode, single modes. Uh, this is what the package device looks like. And then if you compare a, the switch without this uh, 3D wave re, waveguide remapper network to just a switch with the few mode fiber array and the, the um, micro lenses, you see the performance uh, can be equivalent to single mode fiber. So this, these uh, curves just indicate the min-max transmission. Okay, so to conclude, showed spatial multiplexers, um, how to characterize some devices, some transmission results, and wavelength selective switches. So I, I just want to say that the space dimension is the last orthogonal modulation dimension that we can use. So if we don't think we're going to use it now, eventually we'll have to use it. Um, and finally, we might have to use uh, multiple input, multiple out output processing because um, the only way to really drive down costs is through spatial integration or through integration. And anytime you try to put components closer and closer together, you're likely to get some type of crosstalk. Okay, thank you. Okay, last one speaker. So, yeah, I see questions already in the audience. So, Ben. Um, very nice work. He, um, in your animation, you show higher the mode showing larger T time. And then eventually when you show the LP01, you actually show larger T. Actually, for lower order mode, it should come up faster. So if you define T to be a delay, Oh, I, 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 so how, you do, how could you define height? Uh, so you can make the LP mode go faster or slower than the 1-1 one, one mode. You approximated slower? Sorry? You approximated the LP01. Oh, this is a simulation, so I, I, was, I probably wasn't paying attention. But you can... So how, your definition of T is a group delay or not? Yeah, group delay. So this is so a, high order mode typically has higher T. Yeah, typically. So one challenge is making like group delay compensator so you can use a fiber with negative DG, positive DG, D. Without the uh, delay compensator, usually high order mode has higher delay, correct? Usually, but you can change that by your waveguide design. Is there any other question in the audience? Yes. So what is the most detrimental effect? I mean, is it the DG T between the modes or the mode division, mode attendant delay loss? Okay, so... The, mo the one that will limit your distance is the, well, both of them will limit your distance because at some point, like the DGD doesn't affect your performance until your equalizer can't, it gets too large for your equalizer. Yeah. Um, the mode dependent loss, that actually degrades your performance because you get, you get mode dependent, the mode dependent loss when you go through amplifiers and things, you'll get mode dependent noise. And then, um, yeah, that's where your penalties come from, the mode so dependent mode loss and mode dependent noise. Optical domain compared to the DGD in the modes. Yeah, because DGD. Yeah, I mean, you, you, if you if you don't have a, a fiber with um, that's DGD compensated, it, the DGD will be too long to handle even after one span or so. Oh, okay. So even if you have 100 nanoseconds of DGD, that's probably too much to compensate. But you can deal with 10 nanoseconds of DGD. Uh, yes, please. But it doesn't really. Oh. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I know that I, I want to honor one question over there. The question on the spectral efficiency. So I guess in theory it's all orthogonal with WDM. So if I, if I combine this, say, with three channels of three WDM over a single fiber, you know, you know what would be my explanation? Uh, you know, I mean, is this, is it just be sort of truly additive that I could do instead of eight channels? Yeah, it's, it's, fiber, it's additive, but... Um, I think what, so like all these experiments were done with WDM, so there are 32 channels, and um, and we're just using the additive factor to really get the the spectral efficiency increase. But um, I, I, when you go to larger wavelength bands, you have to make sure that your your DGD is low across that whole band, and your mode dependent loss is low across that whole band. But yeah, you can add wavelengths on top of the space. Yeah, yeah, ideally. Yeah. 
So, uh, ladies and speakers, uh, we conclude this uh, first session of today.